Hi, my name is Klebert Sukonik. I work for Red Hat. Um, I'm, I'm uh, on the ActiveMQ PMC. I'm one of the commuters on uh, ActiveMQ and Artemis. Um, I, I have been pretty much involved with uh, messaging for the last, I don't know, like the last 10 years. Um, so I have been working with a lot of messaging products on Red Hat. Uh, beyond of the hype of doing Hornet Q at the time, like a refactoring JBoss messaging as Hornet Q, and later on I have been involved with Artemis, which is pretty much a, a continuation of. Um, it's not much a continuation. That's uh, what I'm speaking in a few minutes. Um, so when I submitted the talk, I was um, I wrote as Artemis 2.0. Uh, it's already 2.1 right now, so it's like a, the stream of the release is being pretty active and uh, uh, there is a lot of stuff going on on Artemis. Um, I'm going to be speaking ju about Oranging and how Artemis started, uh, doing a features and doing a overall of everything. Um, you ha we have a short audience. Like, uh, actually, I'm competing with Kafka right now next door, so it's not really far uh, fair for for me. Like a Kafka has more, uh, a lot of more people are interested in that. So it, this is a message broker. And uh, as Adrian said in the previous presentation, message brokers becoming more commoditized. So uh, it's actually a pretty hard space to compete on. It's like a really complicated to get it right. And it's taking me a lot of time to uh, time in QE and uh, quality engineering and running tests and doing a lot of stuff on that. So Artemis, uh, so you, you guys like a lot of. I don't like much of the showing hands, but since we have like a short audience, like if, and by the way, like if you guys have any questions, don't wait until the end. Uh, I consider myself a bad presenter, so you have you guys have questions, you'll actually uh, be more interactive be easier. Um, Artemis is a message broker. Um, it has the origin on Hornet Q, so it has a lot of, we, it's used to be m pretty much a JMS broker. It's a little beyond that now. Um, it's messages are streamed to be in memory, or like we always favor like a the fast delivery and uh, with guarantees of delivery. So messages are, um, uh, acknowledgement and guaranteed delivery um, and we have a lot of um, we have a, like a pretty strong paging system like a when you are running out of consumers or your consumers are running behind um, Hornet Q started in October 2014 um, Hornet Q it's actually had it's pretty old history already. So it started in JBoss MQ, like I have, we had a really heavy refactoring into JBoss messaging. Uh, JBoss messaging was having a lot of um, uh, JDBC dependencies, like a lot of like a JMS, and was really heavy on, um, on not dependence with the application server. So Hornet Q, we did a lot more stuff into making it standalone, but still the main use case for Hornet Q was to uh, Wildfly and uh, and uh, JBoss Seven, and and more recently uh, with Artemis, it became more like a standalone product, and it's uh, it's actually the foundation for. Uh, JBoss MQ7, we, Red Hat just did the announcement a few weeks ago, and, uh, and, and I'm gonna be speaking about the open source version and what can you do with Artemis. Um, even though this is a foundation for MQ, I have seen lots of users like uh, using just the bits from open the open source streaming. So it's even the open source version is pretty um, mature and uh, production ready. Uh, I have seen uh, customers doing like a billions of messages a day, like in with like a large farms, and it's it's a it's a pretty it's a pretty um, a stable product, I would say, right now. Um, so 
the reason for doing for moving from Hornet Q to Active MQ uh, was f first of all like um, Red Hat had uh, contributed and and for Active MQ and was also doing Hornet Q and also inside Active MQ we had a sub project called Apollo because uh, a lot of of what we needed to bring um, uh, Active MQ beyond on performance uh, would require a new infrastructure, like a lot of NIO code, and um, and it was not very easy to develop uh, Active MQ into that. So they tried to to Apollo, and Apollo didn't really succeed. And then we started with Artemis, and and uh, we have had a lot of a lot of uh, streaming on the community, a lot of. Uh, and uh, since we started, we have over like a 3,000 commits since we joined as Apache, Apache ActiveMQ. Um, one of the good things about that is like we could get features from uh, both ActiveMQ. So now we have open wire support on Ar Artemis. Um, you have also a very strong uh, XA, uh, one of the Weakness on ActiveMQ was is, was known for was it's like XA like so if, if you need like a transaction with an application server, um, um, Artemis has a pretty good support for that. Um, we also have like a WestGI and things that came from both sides, right? And as a foundation for um, for for uh, J J Boss AMQ, we had improved a lot the AMQP support. Uh, so it's really high performance. I could get, I could run actually right now into my laptop uh, a Cupid CPP client and generate seventy thousand messages, non-persistent messages a second on, on the laptop, even even on MQP. And um, this this benchmark here is called Quiver. It uh, was developed from one of my co-workers, Justin Ross, and uh, you could use that to 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 measure like a performance on different protocols. And and if if you're any of you guys are using Artemis or any ActiveMQ here, like how many of you guys are using JMS? Uh, no, John. ActiveMQ. ActiveMQ. What version had they played? Uh, with Artemis, uh, I was just actually downloading 2.0 because I was going to 2.x the other day. Uh -huh. I haven't run it yet, though. So. Okay. Um, so, I, I, I'm going to speak a little bit more about why we became with Artemis instead of like a changing ActiveMQ. We had some talks about what would be required to make ActiveMQ uh, NIO and more um, reactive, right? And uh, it wasn't so easy to change the code. And um, so as I said, like a Hornet key was donated to, um, to ActiveMQ. And we had this idea that you could do uh, asynchronous responses right on, onto the server. So whenever you get a client talking to the server, things will go through what we call internally an operation context so that the server never blocks a thread to help the client, to serve the client. So uh, that's actually the main difference and why we actually, why we wrote Artemis from the, that why we brought Artemis to the, to the ActiveMQ community. So, um, it, it, that's the main difference, actually. Like, say, if you are uh, writing to the journal, like I say, you're sending a message on ActiveMQ, and you write to the journal, you will have a thread blocking on ActiveMQ. On Artemis, you fire, forget, and you basically, on this class that we call like operation context, we just uh, set up a runnable, and whenever the I/O or the replication is done, it will send back to the client. The client will think it's, we are blocking because you need like guarantees that the message was sent and was accepted by the broker before you can unblock the client. So the, 
client will think the server is blocking, but we won't have never a thread waiting to be blocked on the server. So it's all a sync. still preserve that you don't tell the client it's written and persisted until you actually have it. So yeah. Yeah, so, the, so for, from the client point of view, nothing changed, but on the server, um, it changes a lot because uh, it's, it, it's actually interesting because when we came up with that, like the server, like during development, the server was not scaling to what we needed. And just by replacing a blocking thread to this kind of thing made the server scale and be a lot faster. And... Um, it's, it was a few years ago, but that's when we could get like a spec JMS numbers like really high, and we actually broke the the benchmark nobody used ever since because it came so fast that nobody ever did like a JMS after that. Um, with like with Chio, uh, MQP became so so well maintained that. Um, for, for a while, it was something like it was there, but uh, it wasn't really um, the main focus on development. But like I say, Artemis 2.0, uh, IMQP is becoming really strong. It's, it's still support the Hornet queue and Artemis uh, clients. It's, it's, it's actually still the fastest. So if you need just like a Java client sending messages, um, JMS or even like the core API is still the fastest way to send. Like we can send like a maybe like a 200,000 messages a second easily on on Java. Uh, but if you need something like a for different clients, it's like um, uh, MQP will provide you. It's too bad they don't have a laser point, but uh, MQP will provide lots of clients for that. Uh, we also have MQTTP Stomp and, and Open Wire for. Um, for legacy support with uh, old ActiveMQ, ActiveMQ5 clients. And in the, uh, the last three years, we have been doing a lot of uh, testing on this to make sure it's stable and working. And uh, um, I, I can see a lot of going on in the community for that, like a lot of discussions on. So f we, we're talking about the producer side. Uh, I mean, from the client, I mean, from the producer side. Uh-huh. Non-blocking, how does that improve the performance of the API? When we did the... the yes, yeah, I'm trying to... I understood the question, but I'm trying to repeat the question. It's, uh, so, so, so you're asking if using asynchronous on the server, if that improved the performance on the client? Yeah, well, when we use non-blocking, we are not block. So, so I'm talking about. So the question is, when you use no blocking, if that improves the performance of the client, or especially from the producer side, um, it did. It, it didn't improve the performance if you had a single producer because you would have like a single thread on the server. But um, for the general case where you have like a many producers. It's it it scaled quite a lot because because you could like a say if you have like a ten producers signed into the server, right? So so we don't flush on every request. So we have on the operation context and we have something that's called time buffers. We wait a few nanoseconds before we flush a write to the disk. So if you have like a ten uh, producers signed into the server. Uh, we will uh, listen for all the ten producers before we do a flush to this. So we have like a you reuse the right time uh, bef between multiple producers, and for doing that kind of NIO, it improves really, really well. So, so up to the point that if you had one producer sending, okay, when you send like a persistent messages, especially if you are requesting to sync on disk, so you cannot sync faster than the disk is capable of syncing, right? So, like uh, for having two producers, it would still have the same rate because they, we are using the syncing for multiple producers, and that's th and that's when we were able to scale a lot more. Uh, that was one of the one of the benefits of um, doing NIO on Artemis for being able to scale for multiple uh, 
producers or even consumers when they're acknowledging right so you have to write to the disc and th but also the contact switch on the server was uh, minimized and also um, like at the memory on using a lot of threads was would require like a, we had cases d during development even before releasing that if you didn't have some kind of like a context in place it, we would run out of memory quite easily depending on the number of clients so uh, you it, still have like limitations from the server and everything like uh, everything else right so but uh, it, we, it, we could use a lot of more hardware by doing the kind of Trick. I uh, so, so if that remains the same with the consumer, I, I think it no, not I think it this certainly does because the consumers will also be doing acknowledgement. Right, so the acknowledgments we also have to translate into a write on the disk, uh, right? And uh, you have like a multiple consumers acknowledging. Um, if if it, 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 the question really depends on how you're consuming. So if you are consuming, uh, I forgot the name of the term in JMS, like when you do consume like a no arc, where you just uh, acknowledgement lazily, it's probably not much a difference because you just write. But, but the the fact that we had like fast storage, like it improved the the acknowledgement time from the from the server to the client. So it's it's it it, 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 it definitely improved. Not not as directly as you can see on the producer, but it, it did. It certainly did. Um, so for MQP clients, we have uh, QP JMS. Um, this is uh, this light here is actually old. Um, it's already supporting JMS 2.0 or 2.1 now. Um, you have like a C++ for and uh, Python. So I sh actually don't need to read that. But like a one thing um, I recently did some testing is uh, even on Azure or MQP.NET it works quite quite nicely. Like uh, even with a um, with .NET. Uh, recently on Artemis 2.0, um, that was one of the latest uh, changes that we did before releasing Artemis 2.0 was changing how messages are, are treated internally. Um, up until recently, um, a message would be converted. So, like I say, if you're dealing with um, MQP on Artemis. Uh, up, up until recently, we would convert the streaming from the message, from the MQP message, into a core message, because it was a core broker had its own protocol, its own message format before. And recently, we changed that to be uh, totally agnostic. So if you're sending an MQ MQP message, the MQP message will stay in its format uh, the entire life cycle. So there is no conversions when you send into um, the client who send MQP server will keep it as an MQP message, and when delivers to the consumer, it's just like a tr transferring the bytes to the to the consumer. So and um, so that means that Artem is now is more like a a, a pure MQP broker, so ac actually agnostic. Uh, we didn't do that to MQTT yet, but uh, MQTT actually doesn't require a lot of transformation before transforming between a core message and MQTT. So it doesn't it really impact a lot on performance, but uh, it's something that we can do uh, pretty soon. And uh, and this kind of thing, um, there is another sub project inside Apache called Cupid. I don't know if you guys have seen Cupid. Um, you can use libraries from Cupid, um, the dispatch broker. Uh, I have a slide about it where you can do like uh, interesting bridges in your data center for networking and uh, like uh, having this as a pure MQP or pure core, like uh, depending on how you send the messages, it really made a lot of differences. Um, 
another limitation that we had for between 1x and 2o, um, this was actually an, something that we inherited from Hornet Q. Uh, it's like we had a prefix on every destination. So like whenever you created, a, a, especially if you were dealing with JMS, like a, a Q would be like a JMS.Q and whatever name you choose. And, or JMS topic, whatever name you choose. Now we don't have a prefix anymore, but we have like a different types of, of addresses. So we can have like a any cast, a multicast. Uh, it's, it's, it will still be internally mapped to either, you, you could map in JMS terms between topics and queues, but it's just a more generic term. Uh, you can do a, a, a few tricks now, like a, uh, determining how many maximum consumers you can have. Uh, those are a few interesting features that we have on, uh, on Artemis right now because of the addressing model. Um, this, two this two changes actually new, the new addressing model and Artemis um, being able to deal directly with the MQP is what actually what drove us to, to split the 1x into 2x. So it was the, uh, if it wasn't for those changes, it would be just like another major uh, 1, 7, 1, 8 release. So when it did that, we had to jump for, for a 2. Um, in the server in component terms, we have like a clients from different protocols. We have our own internal client, which is a core client. Uh, the networking, we are dealing with Netty. Um, Netty actually started uh, uh, trusting and Norman were working at Red Hat at the time that they were writing uh, Netty. So like a Hornet Q was actually the, the project where Netty started it became independently after that, and actually they left Red Hat, and they're doing a lot of higher flights now. But uh, it's 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 really tight coupled with like a, it was built around Netty and around the persistence, the the way we do we do with persistence. Um, we have a protocol manager connected directly with the networking and to the broker, and we can do. Um, we can plug protocols quite easily. It's quite easy to develop a new protocol, especially after now that we internally can do um, special messages in their, uh, in their protocol format. Um, just going a little bit more in detail on, on how the, the contact switching works inside Artemis, um, on the application on the application context that we have, um, whenever you add um, uh, some information to the journal, we also add what we call the, uh, it's not actually a run, it's actually IO task. And it could be doing into three types of journals that we have. One is um, native Libio. Um, Libio is like a, a native API from, actually is quite at the kernel level. Uh, Libio, it's, it's like when you write something to the journal, you're writing something into, um, um, it's a mapped from directly from the memory, directly to the kernel. It's quite fast and you, it uses a lot of less CPU. It's quite low on CPU. Uh, we also have like a regular Java NIO for like a regular files. Um, it's still fast. It can use a little bit more CPU because of the memory, me memory copy between the buffer and the kernel when you write the message. And recently on 2.0 and 2.1, we added um, map, a map or memory, ma memory mapped file. And um, and performance numbers are going quite fast, a lot, a lot fast. You, even faster than what we did with Hornet Q. What happens if you, uh, if you have a crash uh, to the IO task? What happens with the IO uh, talk to them to actually keep crashes? Uh, 
Um, the the IO task, where will the what will happen to the IO task if the server crashes? Uh, up to this point, it's the same as if you had like a, a thread blocking, right? So um, it's, it, it doesn't change much from that point of view, right? So if, if you had a thread blocking on the server, waiting for the IO to happen before it responds back to the client, it, it doesn't change much. So if the server crashes, those IO tasks will be gone, right? So, uh, and the client will receive um, a signal that the server crashed and it will then perform uh, a, 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 a HA um, action. We'll connect to a, to a backup to a, or to try to reconnect to the server as soon as the server is, is, is restarted. So when the... So just let just help me reproduce your question. This the, if if the server, in a traditional way, it will be blocking. Right, it's blocking uh, thread uh -huh. until the uh, until the message is being returned to the file. Yeah. The thread is still active, right? Yeah. So so. so crashes, the client knows that uh, my transaction is yet not complete. But so in this manner, uh, it automatically gets the acknowledgement and the uh, IOTAS. Uh, uh, so it, 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 the semantic is still the same as if you had a blocking or, or non-blocking. So uh, I'm, not, I'm never telling the client that the message was synced until it was actually synced. So it, it's the same semantic. But instead of having a thread waiting, I have like a data structure somewhere with a callback for as soon as the, uh, as the data has written to the disk. From, from this point of view, it's exactly, exactly the same semantic. It doesn't change anything. So, so if, if you are looking into... So, so it's, it's the same thing if you think what will happen to the thread if the, cr if the server crashed. The, tre the thread will go away. What will happen to the IO task if the server crashed? It will go away. Uh, but if, if the what, what could happen then if the server crashed is like a, whenever the information is, is persisted, then you confirm back to the client. But then you have the same semantics if you are blocking or not, because then you could write to the disk and you could have a crash at the time that you are going to send the information back to the client. Now the client has to do some uh, duplication check, XA, or to make sure that the information was stored there before. It, it, it does, it does uh, like a, the fact that we are doing this uh, synchronous doesn't change absolutely nothing. Okay. Uh, if it's too, is it tunable? How often flushes? Yes, it is. When you, I'm planning to do a, um, uh, to create a to do a little uh, demo. Uh, I'm not going to do much, but it it should show, show uh, w what is done. And that, that. Is there any consequences for this for ordering of how how messages get persisted uh, to this in terms of? You know, if there is any consequence, you order how. Uh, or if, if there's a broker crash. Um, um, no, there is no consequence okay. for ordering. It, it, it pretty much happens in order. Yeah, uh, with with lib, yeah. If there is any consequence to ordering, it, yeah, it, it it happens in order because the the IO task is actually guaranteed. The order is never answering uh, a, a question. It doesn't asynchronously pull those off. It's no, no. It's, 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 it, it, yeah, it goes it goes through a list. It doesn't pull off out of the list. Uh, there there is one internal thing with libio. Uh, because when you write, we using libio. Libio, it's it's sending a signal. So there is a library in Linux called libio, but it's everything that's done is just sending a signal to the kernel. It's yeah. really it's really shallow. There's, there doesn't do much, and the kernel may decide to write out of order. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but then um, on the structure of the journal, um, I have um, on the structure. I have to guarantee that the whole set of the transaction is is there before I can I can re reuse the 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 information. Uh, actually, if if you if you if you look at the um, journal internal format, um, we have like adds and deletes in a file. 
uh, as soon as the file is 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 full, um, we actually we pre-allocate a file. The default size is 10 megs. Uh, you can you can configure that to whatever size you have. Uh, as soon as that is full, you have uh, records and file too. Add updates and then you have uh, like a delete, right? So as a, as soon as you delete the whole file, the file will be uh, ready to be reclaimed. And uh, when we reclaim a file, we don't delete the file. We just set a header with the, with an ID instead of like a filling up with zeros. Then like the whole file gets back to the to the reuse. So that's way we can do like a very fast writing on on the files. And there, there are a few other internal things that I didn't put in the picture, but um, on as part of those ads, you have like a transaction ID for each record. So whenever like a, e even when you're not sending transaction, the broker may may write uh, with an internal transaction because you you don't want to have like a message and not have the add to the queue eventually, like because you write store the message, then you add a reference to the queue. And then sometimes we do like internal transactions, even though they are not exposed to the to the client. And then like a, if if because of the kernel and Libio decided to write in different order, um, we may um, we want to make sure that everything is there before we we, we actually read. Okay. Does uh, does the journal ever get compacted uh, if you have unacknowledged messages? Um, if the the if the journal ever gets compacted. Um, Th there is a situation where the journal gets compacted uh, with those ads and deletes. Uh, eventually, uh, you could have like a, what we call like a linked list effect: add, delete, add, delete, add, delete. And like if you have one record hanging at the beginning, yeah. it will hold a whole list of files. Sure. So what we do is, um, so if the file gets too big, we we call a compacting, and we and with the broker running, we 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 copy to a new set of files and start start fresh from that. So so. So, so uh, it does eventually get compacted. Yeah. It doesn't work the way ActMQ does, where if you have non-acknowledged messages, um, you know that whole journal extent will still stick around. Um, okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So it, so the question is if it's different in ActMQ. Yeah, it's different. Yeah, It, it will keep that 10 megs on disk until uh, yeah. it expires or, or you... Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, we, it's, it's different. Okay. But we, we have one, right now we have one journal for the entire broker. Uh, so like all the messages are stored in a single journal. Un unless you're paging, like uh, I'm, I'm going to speak about paging okay. in, a, in a bit. Um, so the... I actually, I saw a joke once in on the internet saying like a uh, uh, write only devices that never read. So it's, it's actually as the as the broker is running, it's it's write only and never and never read from the journal. So it's it's built for um, for fast recovery in case of the br of the of the broker crashing. Uh, th this is actually why you want uh, message persistence in, in in a messaging broker just to recover from disk in case of crash. So for that, um, the message will stay. Uh, it's it's not re it's ne we never read from the journal, so unless you restart the broker, right? And um, and it's fast writing. It's different from paging. Uh, paging. Uh, I was actually reading on Kafka. This this was re written many years ago, but Kafka has like the partitions, right? So uh, we call we call page files. So you write a page file, it will keep growing a page file in case you are writing beyond the capacity that, the capacity that you configure, then you start using these uh, partitions or page files to, um, to, ex to go beyond what would be capable of the memory. We do um, reading cache. In that case, uh, when I read uh, something from paging, I read the whole file. So, like, say if I'm reading 10 megs of files, then the whole file will be in memory. I think I keep up to two uh, page 
uh, pages in memory. That's configurable as well, depending on how many consumers you have, right? Um, if you don't use uh, transactions, this works really well. It's there is no limit for that. If you do, however, is using transaction and paging, um, there is a limit because uh, transactions is still need to be uh, stored in the journal. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, you can go you can go really far with transactions, but if you're sending one transaction for every message, you're still using a lot of. Uh, you're still using a lot of data structure in, in memory for, for keeping up with the transaction. So uh, so if, if you plan to use messaging as a database or to stream a lot of stuff, be careful with, with, uh, with transactions and paging. Um, so basically a transaction will be required to stay in the journal. Um, I think this slide here where it's talked about it, right? So when, you, when the client sends something to the context, uh, the context will be take care of like a writing to the disk. Uh, it will also write, the context will also be responsible to, to talk to the, to the replica. Um, in case you're using HA and replicas, um, the, the replica, whenever you start a new, a new replica, it will catch up with the server. It will copy everything to the server, to the to the to the new replica, to the backup, and it will uh, then start doing a synchronous write. So you write to the disk, you write to the replica, but you never you don't need to write to wait a sync here, right? You just need to guarantee that it was accepted by by the backup, right? And the, it's uh, on a lot of tests that I have done. Uh, it has a minimal delay impact on the master. It, it, will, inc it will add some, um, in increase a little bit of latency, but it's not, it doesn't affect much on the throughput, right? It's, it's really, um, it's pretty well behaving at this point. Does, does it not acknowledge that the client until after it's propagated the replica, or? Uh, it doesn't acknowledge, the no, it, okay. it, it, it with, I don't, it's, so the, it does not acknowledge the client to use propagated replica. Yes, we we don't we don't send uh, confirmation back to the client until it was written to the replica. However, I don't need to wait a sync on the disk for the replica. I just need to wait a sync for the disk here, okay. because so it only has to be in memory and replica. Yeah, on, on the replica it will be written to the disk, yeah. but it will be on the memory for the the. I mean, it could be on the cache for the disk. Yeah, it could be. In yeah, because whenever the server crashed, you have to close the file before you activate the server, so you don't need to wait for a for a sync on the replica. That would be too much uh, going on if if it, if it was the case. Um, for for how for how high availability we have uh, replication, as I said, we have some split brain protection based on pings. We have a component that we call like a network health check. You can specify a, ping, a list of ping addresses in case you want to make, sh in case you want to configure what to do in case you pull up the cable of the replica, right? Uh, ActiveMQ5 actually, well, it, uh, the replica that you had, like if you lost the connectivity with the, the, the live, the live would, would stop itself, right? But uh, what to do if the replica crashed and not the server? Then you lost both nodes. Right, so so what we do is to, to differentiate between if the replica crashed or if the live crashed, we we can do we can check in a, in a given AP to see if the network is still available before you can actually uh, um, enable or activate the backup, uh, activate the replica, and and the other way it's the best is using more than three nodes. Using a using a quorum. Uh, right now we do our own quorum. Uh, we we have been talking about using Zookeeper in the short term f future, but right now we're still using our own quorum and you know, voting for that. And another s option that we have is like a based on shared storage. Right. Switch over, like 
if I would keep if if I would keep the internal code, you, yeah, or, 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 or if, uh, yeah, I'm not. I, I, I'm talking as a developer. I I wouldn't I wouldn't drop the code. I would add as an option to use a zookeeper. Not uh, not uh, okay. I'm not looking to to remove the code for for the quorum. We may improve the code whenever we remove it. Okay. So. Uh, so I, I, I can see uh, the way I look the code whenever I'm refactoring to use Zookeeper, I'm pretty sure that we'll find different ways, and but it will keep the same semantics on what you have yeah, now. Because Duke Reaper is pretty good for big setups, but for smaller setups, um, it definitely can be a lot of management overhead. Yeah. Um, okay. So we have, with Artemis 2 now, we have two ways of clustering. Uh, one is the internal clustering based on bridges or what we would call like a network of brokers on TMQ5. Uh, but with, um, with Artemis 2 and the way we're dealing with MQP now, that there is one interesting project in, in Cupid called Dispatch Router. Um, this is actually, if you guys look up on the documentation around uh, JBoss MQ, um, it's what it's called interconnect on MQ. It's actually the same. Uh, it's the same thing. Basically, whenever you don't connect a client directly to the broker, you have clients connecting to to the router using MQP protocol, and you you could have like a pretty extensive pictures on this, right? You could have like a many routers. Um, you can do actually quite complex setups with this. It's thinking about like a big networking and and supporting like a um, millions of connections on IoT scenarios. That's the kind of thing that this is this would go after, right? So like a Cupid's patch would actually improve quite a lot. And the next slide, actually, this is my last slide. After this, I'm going to do some. Uh, um, running a broker, it's it's actually quite recently we have been using uh, we have been using Netty for forever, and um, we now using the pull buffers for everything internally. Like when you write to replication, when you write to the disk, when you write to to, to paging, and that decreases quite a lot of the the garbage collection pressure. And the next step that we are doing now is like when we have the message, the message will also have a body on the server. That body will also be using uh, a pull buffer. And that will, I'm sure that will improve quite a lot of things. It's, uh, it's, it's actually what I'm working now. It's on this, in this step right now. Um, there are the things that we have to improve. Like we, we, we're still looking to do a admin console and that um, we have on the, we have one on internal for Red Hat, but we need to to bring one for for actually even active MQ5 needs a refacing on the admin console and the website, of course. Uh, this would be a bit challenging for me because I have to look at the screen as I do this. Um, when you when you download Artemis, you have this little being executor here where you can create a broker. So if I'm gonna call Artemis create I'm going to create a broker at my presentation, work my presentation. What's happening here is asking me a user, a password, if I allow anonymous, anonymous access. Pretty much I already created a broker. But what you see here is um, auto tune in the journal. So it's saying that my, my disk can do 25 writes per millisecond. This is actually um, 
calculating the most optimal value for the time flush for the disk. So, so the the timeout for the journal timeout here will be forty thousand nanoseconds. So, so that means like a, this, the broker will issue a write to the disk every forty thousand nanoseconds. So, if I go to my presentation. I can start a broker. And there are a few tools on the CLI. One that I liked a lot is the producer. So it sends like a thousand messages in 648 milliseconds. If I do again, it probably low, probably be like a 500 milliseconds for this much. And if I do consumer, it received like a, all these thousand messages. It, this is actually pretty fast, and it's still guaranteeing like a guaranteeing making guarantees about the acknowledgments and and um, on the ATC, you see the broker configurations. If you want to like um, to change, say if you ever change the hardware, you could change like a, the time rights and do a, a bunch of stuff here. And the last thing I wanted to show on this crash demonstration um, there are lots of examples here and all of them are runnable so say if I go to um, topic if I just type Maven verify it will run the broker and run the server and do everything so all these examples are runnable and you can use them to debug or making sure you understand the broker um, so just to conclude Artemis is very rich in features um, it takes makes a lot easier on the client so it's not just JMS and I hope you guys Enjoy the could get some information to you guys. Any any more questions? Um, I was curious about the uh, like web console. Act on has a pretty decent web console and integrated with a lot of other type things. Um, is Artemis gonna kinda get to that point? Because I know it's a little a little less feature rich than the Act on Q one right now. Uh yes, if the about the question about the question is if we have an uh, and a console, we don't have a console right now, okay. but um, we had some uh, mishaps with the community about like uh, the way that we were going to do a console, sure. and and now we, since we delivered two zero and two one, we can dedicate some time into that for. It's on the roadmap, basically. It, it is on the roadmap. Yeah, it is on the roadmap I, actually. I it recently, so. um, well, I'm not sure if it's on the public roadmap, but uh, it's. I'm definitely, uh, as a developer, I'm looking myself and. Yeah doing that it's just like it's so much being done on just refactoring uh, MQP was a lot of working to, to get that so, so. what How difficult is the migration for Artemis? Um, if you're not using, I think I think the only thing that's stopping some people from moving is what they call uh, virtual bro virtual topics that you don't need with uh, with uh, JMS two because you can having you can have different ways of creating consumers. Uh, but if you're not using anything special like that, it's pretty easy. Just JMS makes that easy. Like uh, even we uh, support even the ActiveMQ clients with open wire clients, and so it's not very difficult at all. Can you? Data porting. There is an exported that was just released from uh, ActiveMQ five. We can import in Artemis. So I mean, thank you guys. I have to. Thank you. Thank you.